during this very challenging time where we had to be forced to be separate from our friends and our colleagues, I was really grateful for this Anchor app, which has allowed me to continue the podcast after almost one year of working on it. Uh, It's free. You simply go to anchor.fm and download the app. And there you'll find all the tools that you need to record and edit your podcast, as well as to invite people onto your podcast through the app. Uh, Anchor also distributes the podcast for you on Apple, Spotify, and many other platforms. You have absolutely nothing to do except to record your podcast. Uh, If you have an ad like this, you can also make money. Uh, It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Uh, I would recommend it for anyone who wants to get their voice out there, has something to contribute, go for it. Anchor.fm is where you go to download the free app and to get started. Good luck with your podcast. These are the last two episodes for the season and for the year 2020. I hope you enjoy them. This one with Paul Laster has a very special place in my heart because Paul was, uh, as I tell everyone who asked me how I started in the art world, when I was uh, graduating from NYU, I would see Paul at art gallery openings and he said, look, you are always at these art openings. You love art and you're a writer. Why don't you come and write for me about art? And so I did a few um, short articles, which he always edited very well for Flavor Pill and for his other publication. Anyways, he's a great guy and you can listen to him and hear it all for yourself. Enjoy. Good morning, Paul. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm happy to speak to you this early. I don't think we've ever met this early. Oh, I don't know. Probably not, unless it was at a press uh, conference for some show, but uh, that may have happened. That may have happened. Oh, my goodness. It's years now since we met, and I think at that time you gave me my first writing gig at Flavor Pill. You know, I was uh, thinking that. Uh, same thing the other day I was trying to remember if that was the first time that you had written but I thought that it was and I'm I'm glad to hear that confirmed that's happened to a number of people uh, over the years and I'm really happy to have done that because I remember Walter Robinson gave me my first opportunity so uh-huh. wow yeah. yeah Walter Robinson it's true tell me uh, tell me then how you started in the art world so Walter gave you your first opportunity uh, yes. Um, well, you know, I'm a writer, editor, independent curator, artist, and lecturer. And uh, mm-hmm. I, um, I, well, I, how I got started in the art world was really from the time that I moved to New York in uh, 76. I came to New York mm-hmm. to study photography at uh, Fashion Institute of Technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, but soon I got a job at the Museum of Modern Art. And um I started then um, making artwork and um, showing it. And the first show I was in was in the late 70s in Soho, uh, a punk art show um, that uh, got a lot of attention. I remember um, Amos Poe and uh, a and, uh, uh, number of other people were there at the opening. Uh, people that were part of the downtown scene at that time. And then the second show that I was in was at Club 57 uh, in the East Village, uh, that a show that Keith Her- Herring curated. Um, wow. So uh, from then I started showing in Soho and uh, the East Village. And then also I started curating exhibitions of postmodernist photography with my wife, Renee Ricardo. And mm-hmm. we became adjunct curators at PS1 and then uh, we curated shows independently with uh, independent curators and, and organized our own exhibitions that traveled across the United States. And, mm-hmm. and then I started showing my work more and more, first, you know, group shows and then with, uh, with bigger galleries and uh, ended up showing around the world. And, uh, you know, so it's a long story. So basically you started off as an artist. 
yeah, basically I started out as an artist, you know, and I think working at the Museum of Modern Art, um, you know, even though I was only working in publications, that's the thing that kind of led me to um, later have the confidence to feel that I could curate shows as well, because, you know, I was around that type of environment all the time. Mm -hmm. And then how did you segue then into the writing with Walter Robinson, etc.? Well, um, so, uh, as I said, I was uh, an artist and I was showing um, around the world, uh, having sold out shows. I was showing in L.A., Chicago, Boston, St. Louis, uh, London, Paris, Amsterdam, uh, and, and New York, of course. I showed with Herschel and Nadler Modern, Paul Morris, who uh, later founded the Armory Show, was one of the co-founders. He brought me into uh, into the gallery there. And, um, you know, I... Uh, things were very successful. And then the crash came in the early 90s um, and everybody was basically wiped out, um, even more so than the crash that came in 2007, 2008. And so um, because I was self-taught, I'd uh, gone to school you know, at the uh, Fashion Institute of Technology and then studied with Lizette Modell and, uh, and Ian Wilson, uh, Lizette Modell was a photographer who also mm -hmm. taught Diane Arbus, and uh, Ian Wilson was conceptual artist. Uh, studied with them at the at the New School, um, but I didn't have any degrees, so I um, uh, took a job at Shafrazi at first, uh, installing shows, and then ended up uh, becoming the uh, production manager for the catalogs, and we did twelve catalogs in. Uh, in three years, um, and uh, including Herring and uh, Kenny Scharf and uh, uh, a number of other, uh, Donald Batchelor and other artists that were uh, related to the gallery in that time. So um, around the late, um, around the late 90s, like maybe 1998, 1999, um, Tony started representing the Francis Bacon estate and he wanted to do a catalog in a month's time and I had already been working there uh, for you know several years working on catalogs but I was working four days a week 50 hours a week and Tony yeah. said you know Paul we've got to work harder and I thought God I can't really work any harder just have a life. <laughs> and also have a life you know also right. pursue my art career at that time still mm -hmm. and so um, so I left and when I left that's when Walter Robinson uh, offered me the opportunity to write for Artnet. And I founded a column called Brooklyn Spice mm -hmm. on the burgeoning Brooklyn art scene at the time, uh, which uh, was mainly, you know, uh, in Williamsburg and Dumbo. But mm -hmm. um, so that then got me into writing and I soon became, a, I founded an, an online uh, um, uh, art journal uh, that, uh, um, you know, in, in the year 2000 and everything on the internet was new at that time. And the journal, yeah. the journal featured words, images, sights, sounds, peeps, and streams. So I had like streaming, uh, videos. Uh, uh I remember I had Aida Rulova who had just been in the, uh, was in the Whitney Biennial around that time. I had Sean Landers, uh, sound, mm -hmm. uh, uh, piece that was fantastic. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Hernan Bass as a as a as an artist uh, really early on. Um, Franklin Sermons was one of my advisors. You know, I had really interesting people, and I then also started uh, uh, writing for Russell Simmons One World magazine uh, through mm -hmm. um, uh, and Art Asia Pacific through Franklin, um, and then I um, uh, became an editor at Art Asia Pacific and an editor at. Uh, at One World, becoming the art editor when Danny Simmons left. And also Derek Adams was a associate art editor before me as well. And, um, and then I, um, I uh, hooked up with uh, Flavor Pill when I decided to pull the plug on uh, BKYN. They mm -hmm. invited me to come and uh, be their art editor. And then we founded uh, Art Crush in 2005, which was an art publication that, uh, that I wanted to uh, cover art from, uh, from uh, uh, Beijing to Berlin, but it soon became from Mumbai to Moscow. And that's when you started writing for me at Flavor Pill. Yeah. I had, uh, you know, I was editing, art editing Flavor Pill with, uh, 
with uh, Chicago, uh, New York, LA, San Francisco, Miami uh, issues. And then we had Sydney and London issues. And so it was really, really exciting time. Uh, it was super exciting for me. I know I'm, that they had a bunch of events that would go along with these uh, local branches of Flavor Pill, and they were always so art oriented i felt yeah yeah because flavor pill had started it basically as like a, a music uh publication related to the kind of like burgeoning um uh, ambient uh, disco you know rave uh not mm -hmm. disco so much but more like mm -hmm. rave type of scene where where these events would be these dance events would take place with djs uh, more around dj culture and uh yeah and they did a, a lot of them at different museums like the um the Guggenheim and other uh, institutions. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. I kind of brought them more into the art world. So then that, you know, that they, they uh, really broadened their, uh, their scope because then they also acquired bold type from, uh, 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 from uh, random house. Um, and mm -hmm. so then they had a publication that uh, covered um uh, books and uh, and I was the uh, uh, editor for the art books and design books there and they had a fashion uh, site you know so they were really uh, multicultural it was very interesting mm -hmm. um, as you know in that time right and more recently what have you been working on let's say pre-pandemic what were I mean I saw you were lecturing a few places but what took your time up before this whole well societal pre-pandemic I mean you know I um I hadn't uh, curated for a while in 2015, then I curated a show. Um, I mean, I've curated about 20 shows since 1985, but in 2015, I curated a show called Weekend in the Country at Magnum Metz with uh, uh, Andre Serrano and Anthony uh, uh, Goikalia and uh, 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 Jason Middlebrook and Donna Moyland and uh, really interesting uh, um, artists working with uh, with landscape in you know in a contemporary art and photography uh, sculptural realm, and then I um, I started organizing lectures for the Outsider Art Fair, which I had written about over the years, uh, many times and covered. And uh, uh, I I the first was a lecture uh, a panel on Basquiat that uh, that I organized, and then um, they had me organize a couple of other panels on visionary artists and. Uh, and uh, uh, other topics. And then I uh, started curating shows for them as well. And I curated a show of Mohammed uh, Ahmed Ibrahim in 2019 at the Outside Art Fair in Paris. And uh, mm -hmm. he's going to represent the, uh, the UAE at the next uh, Venice Biennale next year. Um, uh, a fantastic mm -hmm. artist uh, living on the, uh, on the, in the far reaches of the UAE on the water. Um, he's really interesting guy. Had been a, a, a studied psychology, but uh, then became an artist and had been a policeman and all types of different things. Uh, but he was uh, great friends with Hassan Sharif, and so uh, together they worked in a very similar, uh, similar way. And then in um, uh, well, that's that's pre-pandemic. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, you know, I was writing, uh, writing for Gallery Magazine, doing interviews for Time Out. I got to interview uh, uh, incredible people for Time Out, Alex Katz, uh, Peter mm -hmm. Saul. Uh, um, mm -hmm. You know, I started doing interviews um, way back at, uh, at One World, like with uh, Micheline Thomas. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I've interviewed Kehinde Wiley for Time Out when he had his Brooklyn Museum show. Uh, I interviewed Derek Adams back in the day for uh, for One World as well. When uh, uh, or or no, I actually I signed that to someone to do, but um, but yeah, you know, it's like um, interesting working with artists from all around, artists and curators. I, uh, I at Art Space, I or at Art uh, Crush, I interviewed uh, Okuyen Wazor. Uh, when mm -hmm. he was curating a show at uh, ICP in New York about African photography. Um, so, I mean, I really, uh, the even though I love being an artist and, uh, you know, love the, the fact that one can lose uh, oneself in the making of art and then, you know, kind of find oneself when the piece is finished um, and find oneself through the work that, that, that you create, being a, a writer and an editor is very exciting as well because of the way that I have 
have the opportunity to interact with so many interesting people. Um, uh, like I said, last year I interviewed Alec Katz, which was amazing. You know, he's in his 90s and like still uh, making the most interesting work. Uh, you know, I've um, had, uh, it's really been a golden opportunity to speak with artists from, uh, from Japan, from China, from, you know, from Africa. I've recently been uh, interviewing a, and writing uh, about a number of emerging uh, African artists as well. Wow, I just love that you've uh, been there from pretty much the start of this whole contemporary scene in New York and uh, you somehow expanded. And I mean, that uh, art fair that you work with, the outsider art fair, you know, it has a very special place in my heart because I just love that uh, guys like the one you worked on are now in the mainstream, like the Venice Biennale. What's his name again? You you said it, I forgot it. I don't know him. I will look him oh, up. Oh, yeah, after. Mohammed Ahmed Ibrahim. Yes, okay, I'll, I will search him out. Yeah, he shows with Laurie Shabibi Gallery in uh, in um, in uh, Dubai and recently had a show at uh, at Akon Contemporary uh, here in New York uh, last, last, mm -hmm. uh, last fall. Yes, well, as a long-term New Yorker and a member of the art world, do you think the New York on pause had something good to offer New York and the art scene in spite of all these setbacks we've had or well, maybe because of them? I think, you know, it's yet to be seen. I mean, usually artists make really interesting works in these times. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, sometimes curators come out with, with new ways of working. I mean, you know, in 19, in the, in the, uh, mid '80s, when Renee and I started curating exhibitions of postmodernist photography, there was also a boom in independent curating with Collins and Malazzo, Dan Cameron. Uh, uh, um, uh, let me think who else. Um, a number of other people, though, too, were were um, putting together shows and making their own opportunities, you know, like pitching uh, shows to galleries, to institutions. And they were, and you know, instrumental in helping to form the movements that were going on. I mean, you know, Renee and I were involved with uh, postmodernist photography and that's what, you know, with uh, the show that we did in 1986 called Signs of the Real at, uh, at um, at White Columns had Cindy Sherman in it. It had James K. Sabir. It had Luigi Antani. It had, you know, um, artists that were starting to shape a new, a new movement at the time. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so I think that that's one of the things that will come out of this. Obviously, you know, one of the other things that's come out of this is the use of, of the internet as, as a much more formidable tool, um, you know, for galleries, artists, um, and uh, curators than it's than it's ever been before. I mean, you know, uh, obviously galleries like um, you know Gagosian, Hauser and Wirth, Zwerner mm -hmm. are really uh, cleaning up. Um, you know, with the with the uh, online viewing rooms. I uh, during mm -hmm. uh, the beginning of COVID in March and April, uh, or more like in April and May when galleries were closed. I actually um, in writing roundups for art and object. Um, I uh, wrote roundups of a number of shows that were just virtual exhibitions, but they were done in such a sophisticated way, you know, in that mm -hmm. there'd be videos, there'd be uh, interviews with the artists, there'd be like, uh, um, you know, uh, multiple photographs of the work, the work in progress, sometimes like Marcel Zama, when I wrote about his show at Zwerner or uh, uh, Rashid Johnson's show at Hauser and Worth, you know, it was like incredible. They kind of like background information that you got about the work and, 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 and that the uh, inside look that you got into the artist's working method. So I thought, I think that's something that's already coming out of the, out of the pandemic. But I think also too, like artists uh, utilizing uh, Instagram in, in really interesting ways too, you know, um, there's been a number of artists that uh, Renee's worked with over the last couple of years and myself, uh, uh, artists that I've um, uh, ended up writing about that they really uh, made their mark on Instagram. I mean, Robert Nava, who Pace just signed, is, a, is an artist who I would put in that category. Um, who, someone who, you know, collectors started buying his work on Instagram 
And then um, that le led to one thing after the next. But I mean, you know, the guy is a brilliant artist, so too. And so he makes the work that commands the attention. Uh, you know, can't just you can't just do something on Instagram and 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 it all be, and it be uh, all hype. It still has to have um, uh, still has to have the the right content. The, the you know the strength of the of the of the artist. Yeah, I I absolutely agree with that. I was recently saying that I'm so bored with watching art online, but I think the problem is I wasn't really watching anything good online. Well, you have to keep, you know, it. I I, I know we all get tired of the fact that it, of looking at art online because you know prior to this time period we were more accustomed to. Um, see, you know, 90, 80% was um, in the real life and then only maybe 20% was virtual because we were reading articles, we were looking at uh, websites, we were looking at art fairs in advance of the art fairs online, like looking at the preview on Artsy and stuff like that. But I mean, mm -hmm. I've written about fairs in like Sao Paulo, uh, uh, Dallas, uh, you know, fairs around the world without even going just by by uh, reviewing, you know, making like a, a selection of 20 to 50 works from the fair. Right. I actually once covered Freeze by just uh, picking 50 pictures that people had shot on the first day of Freeze and posted onto Instagram, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so well, you know, at the end of the day, it's all the same except for the individual work. So it, it you're right. It, it works pretty well to write an article. Yeah, like that. I mean, and also, too, what I found in doing that, I did that, too, for Tafaf one year, too. I've gone to Tafaf eight times in Maastricht, but uh, one year when I was mm -hmm. there and I was writing, like, four different articles, one of the articles was um, of, like, people's first day pics uh, that they posted to Instagram. And the interesting thing is uh, you start to see a consensus of, like, uh, you know, five, six, seven people that choose the same piece, you know. Like, I remember at Freeze uh, London, when I wrote about it, Doho saw uh, room at uh, that uh, this, like, big installation that he did at Lehman Maupin. And causes, mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of causes, like... Um, uh, uh, standing big standing figures um, mm -hmm. uh, was like the, they were like photographed over and over people would photograph themselves like coming out of the right at the doorway like they were exiting um, uh, the Doho Sa and then they'd pose with like whole groups and stuff like that pose with cause which everybody always is attracted to cause for that reason yeah mm. yes I wanted to move the discussion. I know we talked a little bit now about the fairs in Europe, but, you know, most of Europe is in lockdown now and we are not in America for the most part on any sort yeah. of lockdown. Uh, what do you think we can do as a community to support artists who are having a hard time? I mean, in Europe, I heard artists have a stipend from the government now that helps them. I mean, the regular person in Europe has some kind of support from the government to get through all the businesses being yeah. shut down what can we do in america i'm not so sure you know it's like um i mean the, the 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 other side of the coin in europe is that uh you know artists don't also have the same level of expenses that they have here in america i mean you know one in america um you know artists that go to uh big schools like uh you know columbia RISD, uh, cal arts uh they come out you know with uh big uh, big amounts of money to pay back right and that doesn't happen mm -hmm. in Europe. Europe, if you go to school, Europe's relatively uh, inexpensive at the Reedbuild Academy. And it was only thousands of dollars a year for people to come there to study. Whereas we right. live right near Pratt and people come uh, here to uh, to study. And it's like, you know, tw uh, you know, 20 to 30 thousand dollars a year uh, to to do it. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, yeah. th that's part of the problem. The other thing is like in Europe, uh, apartments are not as expensive for the artists to live in and then studio space isn't as expensive either. I mean, you know, so, um, the, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say how, how uh, artists can overcome that here and how anyone can, can really make an impact. I mean, you know, I do my share in, uh, in writing about artists. You do your share in, uh, in promoting artists uh, through your podcast and, and in other ways, curating shows and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And Renee does that as well um, in curating exhibitions. She's done these uh, Instagram uh, studio visits, stoop studio visits, she calls them, where, uh, 
where uh, she's uh, visited people outside. They brought work outside on their stoop or outside of their mm -hmm. building and stuff mm -hmm. like that, just to keep things going uh, during the time of, of COVID. But, um, you know, and collectors have bought work, um, you know, in the sense of supporting uh, artists. I actually was involved yeah. with a benefit for the, uh, helped organize a benefit for the uh, American Folk Art uh, Museum uh, in October, and I brought in like 65 artists, of like maybe uh, 90 plus artists, uh, a lot that had been in my show or had uh, been in previous shows that I've done or artists that I've written about. But um, that was, those artists were able to sell work. Some of them got a percentage of the work um, to benefit the museum. The museum raised like $250,000. So, you know, it's like, everybody has to think outside of the box, you know, um, like when Renee thought to do this Instagram uh, uh, stoop, uh, COVID stoop visits, um, then she also ended up selling work by the artist as well. So I think, you know, artists have, you know, they, they can post um, little projects that they do on, uh, on Instagram. Artists can try to independently curate shows in their studios with other artists. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, something that I've encouraged artists to do when I lecture, um, you know, even from the beginning, they can just create a show that they want uh, on a, on a website, you know, right, so, right, right. Um, you know, as again, we all have to think outside of the box. I mean, you know, we could all plead to, to collectors to do, to help do their share, but uh, collectors to try to, when I hear of collectors who are buying on Instagram, they use it just bypassing the galleries. So, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's perhaps a tough question. And I suppose, uh, like Obama said, we live in this society where you're on yes, your own. Yes, and... yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, <laughs> we do have funding, you know, we have like uh, um, even more uh, funding for, uh, uh, well, we have like bigger prizes and stuff like that, maybe than what they have in Europe. Uh, you know, obviously, like the uh, uh, MacArthur grant and stuff like that, you know, but, um, but, mm -hmm. you know, and we have a lot of residencies that are to go to, yes. stuff, you know, yes. but, you know, but of course, yeah. most residencies are closed right now. So you know, it, it's, true. I think it's probably even harder for an artist who's coming out of school right now and trying to get a start because, you know, it's like, there's even less opportunities uh, for them. But again, they just have to be like Keith Haring was. That's how, you know, I was inspired by Keith. You know, when I met him uh, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, um, in that he was mm -hmm. a do-it-yourself artist. You know? mm -hmm. And how do you envision the post-COVID art world and the New York art world? I know we talked about more online yeah. presence and stuff like that. But um, I mean, it's somehow I think it's going to affect us even after things, quote unquote, go back well, to normal. Well, I think, you know, obviously there's been some gallery closures, not just here in New York, but in LA too, because I've been doing these roundups for art and object that uh, uh, have been in Chicago, LA, um, you know, uh, did I do one in, uh, did one in Miami, you know, there's been, and, and a lot when I'm looking to see what shows are going on, like in LA recently, mm -hmm. I, I just did this roundup uh, with three artists, uh, Sophia Naret at um, at Night Gallery, uh, Brie Rues at, uh, oh no, Brie Rues at Night Gallery, Sophia Naret at Cone Gallery, and uh, Megumi uh, Shinozaki at uh, Nonaka Hill. And when I was looking for artists to kind of, um, it was thematic of artists that were working with craft techniques. And when I was looking for different shows, I noticed that a lot of the galleries had basically not had a show um, since uh, February or March, you know, uh, when the lockdown wow. came. And so, uh, you know, while, whereas other galleries are open by appointment, even now when, when LA is entering into another phase of lockdown, um, you know, galleries mm -hmm. are, because they attract so few people, they're not, you can't just walk mm -hmm. in, but just like here in New York, I was just scheduling uh, appointments for today. Renee and I are going to the Upper East Side to see shows and, uh, um, you know, uh, you can schedule an appointment and still go to see things, which is good. You know, I mean, I encourage everybody yes, to go yes. to the museums here in New York while they're still open because yeah. you know if things get worse they may have to close again as well because obviously museums it's harder to control the flow of people 
Yes, yes. And I mean, on an uh, even internal level, you know, during this whole uh, pandemic, we've seen a lot of issues come up in the museums and in the galleries related to diversity, harassment, and all of these issues that were somehow under the radar. Yeah, like the, the, the canceled, uh, cancel the art galleries uh, type of thing. You know, it's like uh, that stuff was under the radar. But that also has come out like, you know, in related to like Me Too, and then also in related to like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Black Lives Matter movement of like, you know, uh, there's, a, you know, those types of mm -hmm. stories that are coming out are related to like uh, sexual harassment and also of like race, you know, uh, systemic racism. Mm -hmm. I had to mm -hmm. read about yeah. some of that stuff because well, a lot of those dealers are friends of mine, people that I know well and have worked with professionally, right? And it's really sad to read some of the stories um, about those uh, people. But, you know, I, I, I can't, I also can't let it cloud my vision about the artists that they show, you know. Well, that's the other side of it. You know, we always wonder, well, Picasso was a bit of a jerk sometimes to women, but that doesn't take away from the fact that yeah. he was brilliant. Or if a dealer is, is yeah. um, a scoundrel, that shouldn't reflect on the artists that they show. Yeah, and at the end of the day, people seem to forget that the art world is an old world and the, the ways that of thinking and the ways of acting have been pretty much cloistered for a long time, you know. I mean, the idea of the art world being somehow this place where things are yeah. hidden. Is, is, is I the, think, that's you know, I think, uh, you know, um, one of the uh, first... Um, uh, podcast that I listened to on your uh, podcast was your one with Alain Serbe. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone should mm -hmm. listen to that to have a better understanding, one, how the art world works, because the way he broke down art fairs was amazing. <laughs> He's amazing. Also, I love two, him. <laughs> in the role that a collector and how a collector should develop their collections, you know, the role that a collector can play and how they can, how they develop it. And also where they should be looking, not just at Art Basel, not just at, you know, the big fairs at Freeze and stuff, but at Artissima and, at, at, you know, mm -hmm. Art Dubai mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, smaller fairs mm -hmm. uh, around the world. Yeah, you know? yeah. Art mm -hmm. Bow and mm -hmm. places like that, you know. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, he really is exceptional in terms of the amount of time and energy he puts into uh, art. I mean, it's his real passion, or he, I think he calls yeah. it his disease. On, on the level he travels, on the level of time he puts in, I think on one trip he said he did like 16 or more studio visits in three or two days. I mean, it's crazy stuff yeah. like that. The energy. Well, it's a Belgian, it you know, they've yeah. got that. They've got that. They've got that spirit, you know. It goes, it, it, it's ingrained yes. deep, uh, with them, you know, curiosity, yes, yes. sophistication, and knowledge. You know, they put it all together. And also the economic resources yeah. to do that. You know, none of this is cheap at the end of the day. You might not buy the most expensive works, but in terms of the amount you buy, it eventually yeah. it costs. Yeah, making the right decisions. So. Right. So what are you going to do in the future? What are your plans for the next few months when we are moving into well, 2021? Um, I've been um, I've been advising um, uh, the Intersect uh, Art and Design uh, Fairs on galleries that uh, for Intersect Aspen and Intersect Chicago, bringing in galleries from from all around the world, from Asia, from uh, Africa, from uh, from the Middle East, from Europe, um, uh, from, you know, New York, Chicago, L.A., uh, and uh, and then I also curated a show for Aspen, and then Renee and I curated a show for Chicago of uh, of contemporary artists working with glass because uh, Chicago Intersect Chicago mm -hmm. replaced Sofa, which was the um, uh, art fair that was on uh, sculptural objects and functional uh, art and design. Um, so um, mm -hmm. you know I'm. Uh, working on uh, the next thing that I'm working on with them is uh, uh, a fair online fair called uh, Intersect uh, 2021, which is uh, um, uh, going to be at the time that um, 
uh, uh, Aspen, I mean that, I'm sorry, that uh, uh, Palm Springs, uh, their Palm Springs Fair would have been. It's not a replacement for Palm Springs because it's, it's really about, uh, since Palm Springs is in a desert area, it's more of about an international uh, meeting uh, between galleries from uh, uh, North Africa and the Middle East and California. Um, and um, I'm working on a show for that as well. Um, so that's coming up next. But of course, I'm writing. I just did an interview with Sanford Biggers mm -hmm. that will be out in January mm -hmm. um, for, in Art and Object. Mm -hmm. I just uh, did an interview with um, mm -hmm. uh, Genesis B uh, Bellinger, who has a show at the, at, mm -hmm. uh, uh, with Rodolf Janssen in Brussels and at the Aldridge Museum, and then is working mm -hmm. on a show uh, for, at, a, at a, uh, the Consortium in Dijon. Um, I just did an interview with her. That'll be up uh, uh, later in, um, in December uh, in Art and Object. And uh, I was just putting together my wish list for uh, interviews um, in January and, uh, and um, February with Emerging Artists. Uh, it's related to this column that I'm doing for Art and Object that's, um, that is with uh, uh, Emerging Artists. Um, and um, I, the first one I did was with uh, this uh, young 26-year-old uh, African artist from Nigeria who's in residence right now in Venice and uh, had a show uh, in uh, mm -hmm. South Africa, Cape Town at Ebony Curated. Um, uh, his name is uh, uh, Kalechi uh, Nwaneri. Um, and he's really super talented. Mm -hmm. He shows, uh, he's got a gallery now in, uh, in Dubai, in uh, Venice, uh, uh, London, and, uh, and uh, uh, mm -hmm. South in Cape Town. Um, I mean, at 26, he's like mm -hmm. such, a, a, such a, a talent because he's actually self-taught. He learned to draw from uh, watching YouTube. He learned to draw like with pencil, real, totally realistic. Uh, from watching YouTube videos, that was wow. Yeah, I, yeah, it's really fantastic. Search. And then mm -hmm. I'm reviewing uh, this week. I'm reviewing the the uh, Antoine Sargent's book, uh, "Young, Gifted, and Black: A New Gen A New Generation of Artists." Uh, for Art and Object, and um, uh, I've got some things to do for Sculpture Magazine. Uh, an interview that I did with uh, mm -hmm. an artist from Saudi Arabia. Um, that I need to uh, edit. I'm writing some essays for some artists and, um, you know, so, um, you know, yeah, more of the same, a lot, as, as, as Basquiat would say, same old, same old. Well, it's interesting because, you know, I sometimes think of Kenny Schachter and it's, uh, you guys are similar in the sense of writing and having an art background in New York, but you don't do any advising. Like, I think he has a few clients that he advises or stuff like that. I'm, I mean, I'm not sure, but I, I get that from his writing. That I occasionally stuff. pick up, um, you know, uh, connect people and we'll get a percentage. You know, I usually ask for a pretty small percentage, mm -hmm. like five or 10 percent when I do that, just so that mm -hmm. I make sure that I get paid as well. Mm -hmm. If you ask for too much, you end up chasing it, as you probably yeah. know. <laughs> Yeah, but then again, if you don't ask for exactly. anything, you're happy and not you should to get you. something. You should get something because everybody's. It, you, what happens the first yeah. time you do that, without making any money, is you find out that oh, they made money and they made money and I didn't get anything and I'm the one who put it all together. Right? Yeah. Oh, right. I know the feeling right. way. And too it's one well. thing if you're doing it for an artist that you're trying to help out and stuff. But then as it when it, but it, then if the dealer ends yeah. up, yeah. you know, keep going back to the well you know, and drawing water, then you feel left out. So, you know, but I, as I said, I asked for a small amount and, uh, and then I find it keeps people honest. Yes, absolutely. Well, at least uh, it looks like we keep them honest. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it until you find out later. <laughs> Well, and but that also reflects yeah. on us, you know. I mean, one person said to me recently, you actually believe what these people are telling you. I'm like, why should I? Because if yeah. I tell someone something... Exactly. Trust is important. And that's you know? the thing. I mean, you know, obviously, yeah. you know, we work on trust. And when people do us wrong, then we don't work with them again. But it's so wonderful to work with so many people that you do have a trustful relationship. I mean, you know... Um, 
I am uh, feel so fortunate to have like a relationship with galleries that like if I want to do an interview with an artist from Pace, if I want to write about uh, an artist from Hauser and Worth, if I want to write about somebody from Zwerner or do an interview or get a book, uh, from, I can just like email the galleries and, and they'll send it, you know, because they know me, they trust what I do as well. And I have a, a yeah, working yeah, relationship yeah, yeah. with them. And it's important for me to keep those relationships with them. And that's why I stay honest. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's the long absolutely, game, not yeah. the short yeah. one. Yeah. All right. Well, Paul, I have to run, but it was really good to talk to you. Thank you so much for taking this time and sharing all of your knowledge and the past and the future. Thank well, you so much. Well, it's a pleasure. I'm, you know, uh, uh, the way we started this conversation was you mentioning that I uh, gave you your first opportunity to write about art. And I'm happy now to be here with you, um, you know, so many years later. Um, in, well, as you continue to do what you do and, 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 and make a life out of it, you know, so, uh, you know, we're, we're both fortunate and we will continue doing what we do because we love it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Give a big hello to your wonderful okay, wife. Bye-bye, we'll Nicola. see each other soon. Take bye. care. Bye, Paul. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Paul Laster. Uh, listen in to the next episode as well. It's the last one of the series and it's uh, with a wonderful artist, Hans Optebeck.